in for Steve Feeney today. Steve Feeney is out sick. Um, so he will be serving as our chair this morning. So let's turn over to Sean. Thank you. Call meeting order at 9 37 a.m. Welcome to everybody. So welcome to, to Steve and those of you uh, tuning in. We're glad to have him back. Uh, any introductions or well, I might just, I guess, let us know who's on and then we'll do some. Yep, we'll do uh, seeing uh, virtually. We have Stephen Maples from CDTC, Bill Anslow from Albany County, Chris Wallen from the City of Schenectady, Randy Milano from the City of Albany, Kristen Diot from the City of Schenectady, Jamie O'Neill from the town of Malta, Ed Snyder from GPI, Chris Kate from McFarland Johnson, and Tina Carton is about to join mm -hmm. us from Sarah Springs. All right. I'm going to start around the table too, just to bring a refresher on who's here. Patrick Jordan, Port of Albany. Susan Barden, City of Search of the Springs. Mike Butler, City of Mechanical. Steve Ayatana, I'm here Port Authority. Uh, Greg Richter, Region 1 DOT. Kelly Kircher, Region 1 DOT. Tom McGuire, Town of Albany. Dave Mislitz, CDTC. Martin Daly, CDRPC, sitting in for. <laughs> Martin, you know, there was an ominous beat there. And I'm like, you want to go back? I'm not really <laughs> here. <laughs> when is Dan and the CIT report? And just here for now. He just looked over. <laughs> Andrew Kreshek, City of Troy. I'm Toby Village of Colony. Ross Barrel, CDPA. Melissa Shanley, CDPA. Uh, Rebecca O'Dell, CDTC staff. Jacob Demon, CDTC. Beth Cohen, CDTC. Good morning, Andrew Tracy, CDTC. Liz King, Bartman. Peter Comenzo, Town of Albany. Gary's on the back there. Gary was CDTC. All right. Well, good morning. I don't see anybody here for visitor issues unless I've missed somebody. So we'll move right along here. Uh, we do have a presentation on the Patroon Creek Greenway Feasibility Study. I'll turn it over to Sandy. Great, thanks, um, Sean. Um, yes, so we have been working over the last year on the development of the Patroon Creek Greenway Feasibility Study. Uh, Janice Conis has led that for CBTC, working with uh, the consultant um, team led by Bourbon and Associates. So um, that the project is pretty much wrapped up. Uh, we thought it was a good time to give you folks an overview. So I'm gonna turn it over to Liz to walk you through the presentation. So set this up for you, Liz. Okay. Uh, up to Stephen that we're projecting the PowerPoint. No, we're not projecting. Oh, gosh. So even IT support. <laughs> 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 All right, we're good now. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So thanks for having me. Um, it's exciting to be here just to kind of wrap up this project and share the findings and recommendations from the study with all of you. Um, I know that some of you are pretty familiar with it, but we will. So I'm gonna kind of keep this, just, I just wanted to place the project in kind of an overarching context of the purpose and make sure that everyone kind of understood why this project was pursuing and what the goals of the project were. Um, we did a really robust alternatives analysis as part of the project to figure out what the recommended route is. So I'll go through that. Um, as part of the alternatives analysis, there was also a lot of agency coordination and public engagement that we wanted to um, provide that background as well. Um, then we'll talk through the recommended route and kind of the phasing of that route and then open up for discussion. So my goal is to do this in 15 minutes. Um, we will also feel free to stop me too if you have questions along the way. Um, from a big picture, the Patroon Creek Greenway was identified as a priority core trail in CDTC's Capital District Trails Plan. Um, it's also um, a priority kind of regional focus and project um, in the new visions transportation plan as well. Um, the overarching goal for this project, and you can see 
I think, let's see. So right here is the Patroon Creek Greenway. It's this east-west connector. Um, and the goal was to essentially identify a feasible path for a trail that would provide a much needed east-west connection in Albany, connecting to all the riverfront trails that are running north and south um, along the Hudson River waterfront, and then also connecting west to some of the other proposed core trails that then would tie this into the entire region. Um, we were really building upon a 2004 study. So this orange line shows, so with the Hudson River on the east, all the way west to the Albany Pine Bush. Um, so much of the study area falls largely within the city of Albany with a little bit of colony um, to the north, some, some of the area north of I-90. Um, and we started with the recommendations that came out of a 2004 Petroleum Linkage Study. Um, that study was really primarily using the space between I-90 and the railroad corridor, west headed east, but once you get to Tivoli Preserve, they had a couple of diverging routes um, that we reevaluated and looked at some other kind of options through the alternatives um, analysis. Some of the overarching goals were one, to make sure that we we're providing equitable access to the trail, increasing the quality of life for all the residents in the city um, and surrounding region, improving connectivity, especially for multimodal, um, transportation and really making sure that biking and walking could be a viable mode of transportation and then also public health um, as an additional and but important benefit. I did want to highlight that when CDTC did their environmental justice analysis, pretty much the whole study area, which is shown in gray, was identified as an environmental justice area. We then looked at the New York State um, Department of Environmental Conservation's potential environmental justice areas, which are shown here in Magenta, just to, they have some higher thresholds. So we were able to kind of elevate some of the areas that were probably the most vulnerable. Um, that's what we're showing here. So really Albany's Arbor Hill, West Hill neighborhoods are kind of falling squarely within this space. So really this trail project, um, not only providing that really important east-west connection through Albany, but also serving a lot of communities that um, don't have cars necessarily, are very dependent on public transportation and could benefit from this type of improvement. Um, and then finally, just again, a really unique opportunity. So along this east-west corridor, um, the trail largely follows Patroon Creek. Portions of it are exposed, portions of it are piped, but it also weaves together some really beautiful, unique nature preserves um, in Albany, from the Pine Bush to the west and Six Mile Waterworks being the gateway into that preserve, to Tivoli Preserve that the city has really put a lot of um, investment in recently in terms of ecological restoration and trail development, and then all the way east to the Hudson River and the Corning Preserve. So we put together a series of alternatives, um, and this kind of had it, um, I guess just shows what those alternative alignments were. Really from Fuller Road and Albany Pine Bush East to Everett Road, we looked at some very nuanced alternatives, but they were really using that strip of green space in between I-90 and the railroad. Um, so that's all kind of shown by that green line. But from Everett Road East, that's where we began to kind of diverge and look at some more discrete alternatives. So um, from Everett Road to Tivoli Preserve, we looked at one alternative that went north into Colony, and then two that stayed south in the city of Albany. Um, the trail then was recommended to move through Tivoli Preserve, and then on the east side of Tivoli Preserve, again, we looked at three additional alternatives, um, all of which stayed in the city of Albany, but took different paths to connect Tivoli Preserve to the Corning Preserve and via the Albany Skyway. Um, as part of that alignment analysis, we engaged in a lot of stakeholder interviews. So over 50 stakeholder interviews, a lot of those were on the ground with local businesses um, and local property owners and residents, but also a lot of agency coordination. So much of the corridor from Six Mile Waterworks East to Everett Road utilizes National Grid property. Um, so we did speak with National Grid about their requirements and specific considerations in terms of trail design. Um, a lot of the corridor also, because it follows Patroon Creek, is also following the Albany County um, Patroon Creek trunk sewer easement. So that picture right there is a picture of the county's access um, via that easement. And the majority of the trail from Fuller Road to Everett Road would also utilize that easement or be adjacent to it in many circumstances. Um, CSX and the railroad, 
to the extent possible, we avoided using any railroad property, but often we were within about 50 feet of their right of way. And so that does start to kick in um, additional considerations for designing adjacent to the railroad. Um, there is one small stretch of CSX property that's kind of unavoidable between Central Ave and Everett Road. Um, so that would require further coordination moving forward. We also talked with FHWA, the local region um, specific to utilizing some of the interstate right of way um, adjacent to 90. And then we also talked with DOT really specific to the Everett Road Bridge and plans for replacement of that bridge. But Everett Road Bridge is, and you'll kind of see, a really key connector um, to making that whole trail possible in the future. I'm not going to go through this. I don't expect you to read it, but I did just want to note that this is a page directly from the report. And from those conversations with the different agencies, we really pulled together what some of the key trail design criteria are and considerations um, so that this hopefully is a really helpful springboard for future design development um, of the trail itself. In terms of public engagement and uh, getting feedback on those all alternatives, we did have two advisory committees that shepherded us through the whole planning process. One that was a project advisory committee that was more technical, another that was a citizen advisory committee comprised of a lot of different local residents, neighborhood groups, and other kind of special interest groups. Um, we had a project website that housed all of the information, including an online survey specific to the alignment analysis um, that we got over 350 responses to. Um, a lot of advertisement for that survey was a lot done through on the ground outreach through our community liaisons, which were shown on the right, but they were um, had really tight ties to the local Albany neighborhoods in West Hill, Arbor Hill, and helped us really get the word out about the survey. Um, these are just some images of the different engagement that happened throughout. Some of it focused on the alternatives, some of it focused on trail facility preferences kind of later in the process. So this shows the recommended route um, that came out of that alternatives analysis. Um, this is a near-term route. So again, from Albany, Pine Bush, and Fuller Road, we're recommending an off-road trail pretty much from Fuller Road to Everett Road with a short portion of shared road along Yard Row. Um, once you get to Everett Road Bridge, again, really contingent on the redesign and replacement of that bridge, the trail would come south just for a short block on um, Everett Road and then head east along Waterville and Commerce. Um, it would then kind of head south uphill along Terminal to head into Tivoli Preserve. I will say that that alternative was the least popular by a public opinion, but not by much. Um, it is the most feasible though, because it uses all public right of way. It would be the easiest to implement immediately. And the reason that some public participants voted for it was because of the connection to Livingston and the connections into West Hill, recognizing the importance of tying that trail into the communities. It also- I good on that point. Yeah. Where the, what was the other, project that outscored this and what was the reason this was this was uh, that project wasn't selected as the near term so the or my future term here? is the one that was the highest and most mm -hmm. popular by the public um and that we just identified that as something to work towards if it can happen sooner great but it does require quite a bit of private property either easements or acquisition um and then the topography getting in the western portion of Tivoli Preserve um, it's pretty, it's really steep, like 60% slope. So okay. kind of figuring out additional design development would really be needed to really understand what's the best way to get into Tivoli Preserve. Um, this portion of the trail, though, I also note that we talked a lot with the Albany Water Board and to get into Tivoli Preserve from that southwest corner, it's right next to a CBTA bus stop. Um, and it's an existing gravel road that the Albany Water Board uses to um, access and maintain its critical water infrastructure. But we spoke with the Albany Water Board and Joe Coffey, and they were really open, depending you know, on how we design it and ensuring that non only non-motorized use, uses were able to access, the opening up that portion of the preserve and creating a new access point into Tivoli. Um, I think from a preserve perspective too, that opens up a lot of doors. And that's kind of what Joe was noting is that they've done so much work right in Tivoli Preserve. And right now you can access it here in the south and here in the east, but there's really no access here. Um, so I think, again, another benefit of that near-term alternative is just opening up to the Lake Preserve 
to more of the surrounding neighborhoods as well. Um, now that we're here on the longer term. So again, the short term option continues through Tivoli Preserve and then would head south and kind of work its way east along roads, again, using all public right of way, heading down Manning to Tenbroke and then Clinton and onto the Skyway. Um, this was the second most popular public option, largely because of all of the community connections it made to neighborhoods, um, multiple schools, and cultural um, destinations. Um, but then the most popular routes were these up here. So as you can see in the lighter color and dash, and we're recommending those just as a future kind of later phase so that really that near-term phase is something that's very feasible to start pursuing now, get that immediate east-west connectivity and then build out that future vision over time. Um, so again, yeah. On the on-road on -road separated trail facilities, what is the separation? How how are you gaining? Uh, cool. okay. So we, and that's a really good point. So what we were doing as we were working through this, and I'll get into it a little bit more, is we tried to find either, because it was a greenway, we were very looking for routes that provided the most greenway-like experience, so either off-road or as much separation as possible. Um, for a lot of the trail in here, it's a pretty large right-of-way, um, and so we were looking at like an eight-foot wide landscape median, and then that would provide the separation from motor vehicles within the bike um, head facility on the opposite side of it. Um, the long-term vision headed kind of north. This is, again, the most popular through the public survey. It follows the true oak path of the Patron Creek Greenway. So requires, though, one, a lot of there's, it's pretty steep terrain back here. Um, it goes under US-9, and that's all public property, but then it goes, would need a whole new bridge to go over the railroad um, to tie into Tivoli Street, and then we'll come down Tivoli Street on a shared facility which is pretty low traffic, and then head south on Broadway. Um, I will say that I think we highlighted the Broadway piece as a really important connection. Um, I know it's high on the city's priority list to integrate bike pet facilities on Broadway, so that section of that kind of future vision could likely happen sooner than maybe some of the other pieces. So to so the point about the different types of facilities, um, as part of the survey and then also a lot of our outreach kind of in the spring and summer, focused on now that we have a route, what do you want that facility to look like and what do you want it to feel like? So 80% of survey respondents said that there are places in Albany that they'd like to bike, but they don't currently feel comfortable. And those were a range of recreational destinations to schools, um, places they could commute to, but a vast majority um, noted that there were several places that they would bike to if they felt comfortable. Um, when we asked about what type of facility would make you feel most comfortable, 85% said they either wanted an off-road trail or a separated bike lane, um, and that's what would make them feel most comfortable biking in their neighborhood. So this is an example along Manning. Um, we looked at a couple different targeted points to get feedback from the public, and by and large, the separated facilities were the most popular. Um, the one on the left being if you remove one lane of parking and preserve it on the opposite side of the street, you could fit in with that right of way, a really nice wide landscape buffer, um, and then the separated bike head trail. On the right picture, that would be if you retain parking on both sides of the street, what bike lanes would look like. Um, I will say for Manning in particular, even with our committees and stakeholders that we talked to, the leftmost option, the more separated, was really popular. Um, that section of Manning, people really speed down, the parking is underparked. So getting that landscape buffer in place and losing that one lane of parking um, was the most preferred facility type. I'll also note that as we kind of talk through these with the public, that landscape buffer would provide, you know, you could look at making it integrated with stormwater management, um, starting to address some of the climate issues, getting trees into that corridor, into that neighborhood, um, and really beautifying that whole corridor too. So more than just a separated facility that hopefully makes biking and walking a much more viable um, mode of transportation. We looked at a couple of different crossing options at Fuller Road, Central Ave, and Everett Road. Those are all kind of left on the table in the report. I'll talk through those here in a second. Um, the report has a lot more too about access points. A lot of them coincided with CDTA bus stops um, from major trailheads at each of the preserves to minor trailheads at major intersections. 
some of the smaller trailheads and also a lot of interpretive opportunities and interpretive stops. So we're really recommending the first phase and this could be broken into two or three phases too, but really building that portion of the trail from Everett Road to the Albany Skyway um, through Tivoli Preserve that all uses public right of way. Um, in total, that whole stretch, which is probably four miles, um, would be about 18 million. That does include largely all separated trail facilities with the landscape buffer. So that um, that's kind of what's driving the cost there. Phase two looks at starting to build off the western section. So getting from Fuller Road and Albany Pinebrook Preserve, Preserve to Central Ave. Right there at Central Ave too, there is a bus stop. Um, so that would start to provide connectivity from that major commercial corridor out to the Pine Bush. Um, the range of the cost estimate depends on what you can do at Fuller Road. Um, at Fuller Road, we did look at not only at grade enhancements <clears throat> to make it easier to cross that existing traffic circle, um, but also what a ped bridge, so a separated crossing would be. Um, the next phase is then really kind of completing that middle section contingent on the Everett Road bridge replacement and the variation there in the cost is looking at Central Ave. So not only did we look at um, signalization at Central Ave right there so and at grade enhancements, but again, a separated crossing. Um, and then we also looked at if you did full restoration along that section of the Trim Creek, which is already open and exposed there, but again, kind of building on what's been done at Tivoli Preserve and really making that whole corridor not only a great route or trail route, but also um, something that has ecological value as well. And then the last piece being that longer term vision. So that does include the structure to get over the railroad to, to connect into Tivoli Street. And then again, um, some off road sections of trail that traverse some really steep terrain and then the separated facility along Broadway. Um, last slide. So just, I think some of our final recommendations, and we put together a whole essentially chart for funding and some different funding sources that maybe are also a little unique and not always considered for transportation projects like green infrastructure funding as well. Um, but really building on some of the momentum recently related to reconnecting to Albany's waterfront, related to increasing the amount of bike ped facilities available. And that's also, you know, from some of the recent federal legislation also being really stressed and looking at, again, those natural restoration opportunities. Um, we did put together some work on environmental review and what it would take to go through the seeker and NEPA process for the whole corridor, but you know, getting the project as ready as possible to move into design and construction, all of those little steps will really help. Um, and then also stressing agency and municipal coordination. Um, it's a regionally significant project and regional coordination will be required to identify, you know, although it is all right in the city of Albany, it's making some broad regional connections and tying into regional transportation systems. And then also considering including the Patron Creek Greenway as a regional project in the upcoming update to the new visions um, metropolitan transportation plan. So that is the project website where the full report lives. There's also appendices up there too if you want to go through all the public feedback and some of the other more detailed work too. But, Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, any questions for us? I got a question. So traditionally, I would, I would say when you're looking at your, your phases, your early, your lowest hanging fruit is, is one of the phases you want to get out the door first to mm -hmm. let people's appetite. In this particular item, phase one is one of the more expensive ones, and phase two is, is one of the least expensive ones. Is there a reason why you phase them the way you did? Yeah, so for phase one, and I kind of skimmed over it, but I think if you went from Tivoli to Hudson River, that's more like 8 million. Um, so you could break this into multiple subphases, but this is low hanging fruit. One, because it is all public right of way. Mm -hmm. You have site control. Two, the neighborhood connection. So you get these immediate improvements to the most underserved neighborhoods in Albany. Um, and I think the faster you get in, those types of improvements, the more you're going to make biking and walking a viable mode of transportation. And then also from a climate change perspective, if you did do those separated landscape buffers, the sooner you're getting in trees, you know, that's a long lead item that you're going to start to realize those impacts faster. And, um, you know, even though they take a long time to kind of phase in. So, even though this one's most expensive, it has the most impact exactly. to people that live within the city. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Initially, I had seen 
it seemed to have more on-road share. Uh, has this been changed to reflect more so? And I'm just curious, when all of a sudden done, how much on-road do you actually have percentage-wise relative to the entire project? We have, so I guess, and you're saying on-road share, not on-road like a separated. Yeah, when I, when I saw it a while road. back, it looked like down in the city, um, going towards the, the river, uh, the Skyway area, that that area was all on-road, but it's changed. So um, I don't think that we ever proposed it as a shared. I mean, again, we kind of, as we were working through the alignment analysis, we were assessing the most separated possible facility mm -hmm. that we could get in those spaces. The 2004 study might have done some more on-road shared through the neighborhoods. Um, no, but, and then the white head master plan that the city has does for sure have more on road. So we took and based a lot of our facilities use the same corridors that the city has prioritized, but we upgraded the facility. Okay. So Great. that might also have been yeah. a potential for To that point, um, the Capitalize Albany, um, the redevelopment, Funds the DRI and the um, projects is covering that area. Um, I don't know specifically how that was considered in this project, but they, I know at that point um, they were looking at on street um, bike lanes in that area and reconfiguring the Clinton Square area. Right, and unintended, that kind of like came together at the end. They're starting on it. So there's opportunities also with this phase to do more coordination with like. Capitalize all the DRI projects, some of the ongoing redevelopment. And we did talk to Brad Flats at the city really specifically. I think you're talking about this section right here. So that is right from Tenbroke and the Palace down Clinton Ave. And that's the focus. They have an engineering consultant on board now doing that design, but that design is in the early, they just started this summer. So I think there's still a lot of chance to kind of weigh in on that process. That was. Somewhat of my question too was the sort of the next steps. But this is phase one design we just talked about was uh, that one portion. But is there any funding for the next steps in design, or are we do this study go for yeah funding? So design development is again that's not funded for most of the trail. It kind of funds nicely with some of the DRI projects mm -hmm. down at the very easternmost portion. But um, yeah, there's no as far as I know. Okay. The funding was allotted for the feasibility study, and that's kind of where it stopped. I just bring this up. We talk a lot about it at the group is, you know, we have the planning funds. Next step is at least preliminary design funds, because once you do that, then we're more competitive sure. at the federal level for whatever number of sources we now have to go. Um, it just, I'm wondering about for phase four, land acquisition takes forever. Um, and so is there anything that can happen? And that's 29 million, but to actually, do you know how much it would be approximately to purchase the land itself and get that, hold, hold on to that for the future money to actually build the. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, so there's the three properties are right here. One of them is Bimbo Bakeries, Fry Hopper, that is a lot of this, and they sit up kind of on that plateau. Um, and then just to get at the end of commerce over to this area that crosses, I think, two other privately owned parcels. It might even be, I, yeah, I maybe would recommend looking at easements even, because yeah. I don't think that you need to, you don't need to acquire and have state control of those whole parcels, but having just some kind of trail easement using the perimeter of their property where they're already not kind of actively using that space mm -hmm. might be a faster, cheaper way to go. Yeah, it, it just is if we break, I don't know if this part of phase four can start with phase one in the sense of just the yeah. process of land acquisition because it just is so long. Mm -hmm. You'd hate to wait a few years, to get the 29 million, then have to wait another two or three years to get land acquisition. Yeah. And I know that the city and talking with Brad Glass, they're already talking with Fry Hopper um, about some other site changes. So that again is something that maybe they should keep on their radar as they're negotiating with mm -hmm. Fry Hopper with whatever they're doing to improve that parcel currently. I think to what Ross is saying, if you, you know, I'm going to start that, or do you ever want to start that early? Because at phase four, if I'm one of them, now I've got a much bigger price tag on what my land is worth because I'm the last connected piece. Because <laughs> yeah. this is a, once you just kept adding up a number, not a, I know Martin rides bike a lot more 
than I do. That's a hundred million dollars I saw at the end of that for only a few miles of bike path. But it's right through the center oh, of the city. It's yeah. like the spine. I mean, talk about yeah. the Albany County Road Trail is wildly popular. Right. They don't have near the density or the opportunities to connect to one. Oh, That's yeah, awesome. I think it's, it's great. Um, on the com look like on, uh, commerce is your biggest on street, probably area. Do you have business buy in? In there so that would be another kind of next step a lot of i think you know there is right here on commerce also on Pembroke, we have a lot of dense residences too so that is another kind of next step recommendation the report is as you start to move through that design development um there's quite a few industries right on here on um, south side more so than the north side with much larger curb cuts on the south yeah. side and kind of truck traffic moving in and out um, so we are tentatively recommending the north side of commerce just to avoid those conflicts. But again, I think that still requires a lot more individual engagement with adjacent. It's just, owners. well, it's engagement, but it's just safety down the road. Those businesses exist right there for a reason. They're all mm -hmm. together. There might be a few buses that ride around through there. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand what you're saying about manning. It's wider. People can probably park with it, but once you start getting downtown, you start taking people's parking spaces away. It's, it doesn't always doesn't always go well. Um, the overarching question: Is this our study and our start of the project, or did the city or someone else request it? Who's going to be the lead on this? Well, so that's why this is being viewed as a regional project. Um, the origin of this was from the Cavendish Trails Plan. Um, where we had a hypothetical network of regional trails. Um, this trail has been on the radar screen for 20 plus yeah. years because of the alignment, where it is, what it connects to. Um, City of Albany did kind of help initiate this, this next step conversation of let's see what it would actually cost and develop a rough alignment. But as you can see through the process, we've learned, and I don't want to speak for the city of Albany, but this is not something they can do alone. Um, they're going to need a lot of regional help um, to implement even a portion of what you're seeing on the screen. Um, you know, they are doing their part where they can take opportunities on the city streets, even at the speed to at least start putting in the bike lanes, um, just what they can do with paint, even on a public <laughs> level. Um, but it's going to take a while to build it up. And so, you know, we are, we are going to need more of a coalition of champions for this um, at the highest levels of government here in the region to, to see this big idea yeah. um, come to fruition. I just wonder who's going to be, somebody has to be the leader. Has to be an agency somebody has to be the leader. For the grants. And is that is it a special entity? Is it uh, IEA or... CRC or in Albany planning for all to be determined. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's just we're right at the beginning. We're right at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. I think that the purpose of this is really just to see what's feasible, what's possible, um, ballpark what it might take to even get a very, you know, if, if we had all the money in the world, what would it take? <laughs> that's what it would be. But you know, what can we do incrementally over time unless we get a lucky break and you know get access to some major federal funding? But as you said. 50 to 100 million on a trail is a tough, it's a tough one. It's when, a tough one. Yeah, when everybody's pushing for the bridge. Correct. And other things at the right. time. But we definitely don't want to miss opportunities as they arise. And you know, several opportunities were described um, in the presentation. So we're going to try to you know, keep plugging forward, um, particularly in, in the city. This is just a quick follow up. You had a bullet point about the Livingston Avenue Bridge um, and your terminus. Sorry. That's okay. There is the fact that it states Corning Preserve. Is it the anticipation that you would utilize the Corning Preserve for the Livingston Avenue Bridge connection over the river? Yeah, yeah. And I think we noted it in the report. Um, it was kind of right as we were wrapping up this main feasibility study that the Livingston Ave kind of funding was coming through. Okay. Um, but yeah, the essentially the connection right off of the sky would, would provide that opportunity to continue across the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to just know what, not focusing on the 50 to 100 million dollars, but the, the next step money, you know, how much would preliminary engineering be? So that's really the number we got to 
think I'm about. Give, we're happy to answer any of those questions. I'm also going to give Jen our full cost estimate Excel spreadsheets that will let you essentially broke it out into the different alignment corridors that we analyzed, but we put in costs for design for those sections, construction contingencies, and other kind of contingencies related to inspection, survey, mobilization, et cetera. So if we have all of that, um, I'll provide that so that TDTC has access to it. So if you need to kind of adjust and manipulate into your report. One, one thing I'll mention is as the, the first prize property gets redeveloped, there are opportunities to connect into this trail to build stubs that will eventually lead into there. So I think that's critical to keep communicating with Albany and Colony that as that as that parcel goes forward, the connection should be built now so that that way, one, the developer understands that there's a necessity to connect to it, but two, it's not a surprise after the trail is built. And now all of a sudden they're coming forward asking for the connections to be built yeah. on the municipal level. So. And we did cross out a bridge over the yeah. railroad to connect into the third prize site as well. So that's yeah. all there that we'll provide you mm -hmm. in the report too. But I think even you know the presentation on some of those major minor gateways, you know, especially where it comes off the trail and goes over ever provides a real Everett's opportunity. Right, right without yeah. really having to right. worry about a big cost connection into the first prize. There's site. a park over there as well that people yeah. want to get to. Mm -hmm. So okay. But that makes sense with them because they might want to reorient their parking lot mm -hmm. or the building itself on how we would get to back to something like this. Right. Well, we do have to move on. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and we'll, you know, think about next steps, uh, what the CDTC can do, and, and talk with our uh, partners in the region to see how we can continue with this forward. With that, we'll move on to the administration. All right, we've been this the previous meeting on the third. Does anybody have any comments or corrections? Seeing none, hearing them, I'll put the motion to approve the plans. Yes, they might have. And a second. Ross. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right, carries. Thank you. Item 4B Transportation Improvement Plan Fiscal Constraint. Uh, Jacob's going to review table four. Yeah. Um, no major changes in fiscal constraint. Um, we are currently in year four now of the 1924 tip. Um, this is a little out of whack because we're we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the next item. Um, technically, we're not. Um, there's more in year 23. That's on the new tip that we haven't. Well, we've approved it, but it's not live yet. Um, so we are less than 39% under program, but not over 5% over program. So we're in good shape um, starting out the new uh, fiscal year. Any questions for Jacob? On that? I think we're going to discuss that a little bit more. Uh, moving on to 5A interim tip amendment guidance. Great. I'll start with it and um, Greg, you can chime in. So to go into a little more detail on that, um, we've kind of talked about this in previous meetings, but we're going to take an action to kind of formalize how we're going to handle it. So as we all know, we have officially approved the 22-27 TIP, um, and typically that would be in effect now, uh, starting October 1st of the new federal fiscal year. However, do the the delays that we saw here, um, you know, we were able to get it approved in September. The state, however, was not able to get their total statewide TIP um, approved in time. So even though we have an approved TIP, it's not approved at the state level. So therefore, it's not lauded. Um, that leaves us kind of in a limbo uh, between now and we hope mid-November, uh, where the new SIP will be adopted. Um, so that means that we're still working off the 1924 tip, so the old tip, technically. What that means is that there's new projects that were programmed in the current federal fiscal year on the new tip that aren't shown on the old tip. Um, so the action here uh, would be to, you know, even if that action to bring the old tip up to date uh, with the new tip, if that action were to require uh, official planning committee action, like an amendment, um, we're going to view that as project selection um, so that it doesn't really impact any project timelines. Um, is, is that? Yeah, I can 
supplement that commentary. Basically, this body approved the new family of projects a couple months ago. And so this body has an adopted tip that started October 1, you know, four days ago. But the statewide roll up has to go back out for public review, which just happened yesterday. So the vets back out for 30 day review. So we're in the gray area because of the schedule. But we kind of knew this was going to happen when we saw the delays earlier this year. So because this body already approved the new family of projects or the adjusted amounts of the family of projects, if you have a phase that you want to authorize now, between now and when the state catches up, what we're suggesting is that that's just project selection, which is something Jacob can do because this body already approved the amount and the schedule. So if you need a phase authorization between now and we're going to say mid November, hopefully not much later, that we should we just need to move that phase into the old step so we can get the authorization. Does that make sense? It doesn't really change anything, just a little dance we need to do. It's a, <laughs> what, it's what, a this is the you know, highlight zone we created. <laughs> this is the workaround. This is the workaround from DOT delaying. Do you anticipate so, it? Let's yeah. be, let's call it what it is. Yeah. <laughs> we delayed it. We caused this problem. I mean, this is all Not very personally, it. the department. Yeah. Well, what's the reality of it? Do you anticipate any? The latest, I'd say December 1st, the steps live. Oh, no, no, I, not the step, but the necessity to do this. Uh, we have a couple projects. Our, our TMC funding expires at the end of October, okay. and we consolidated what was three pins into one, but they're not shown yet. Mostly so, DOT projects, huh? Probably. Okay. There's, there, I know up north in Egypt, they have a local project that got snagged at this too. But same thing, we're just moving it in. Uh, uh, I think there's some locals hanging out there too here that are coming in for PSNE or design phases. So there'll, there'll be a few of these for sure. And we're only four days in, I'm anticipating maybe a dozen of these being necessary. I'm creative, creative thinking on the, the part of folks on the table. Correct. All right. Uh, let's see. I think we need a motion to approve the interim guidance. Okay. All right, Greg. <laughs> we don't want it. <laughs> 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 we don't want it. We don't want it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. All right. On to item B. Um, we know we have. If you want to do these as a group, can we do these in a group? Um, there are different sponsors. So we'll start with um, I-90, uh, which is a DOT project. Okay. Uh, so the other topic we all love to discuss is inflation. And uh, we're at PSE with our I-90 pavement servicing project here. And uh, the prices we've seen this year are reflected in the estimate, okay, which is driven up, driven us off by about $2 million uh, adding, going from 8 million change to just over 10. Uh, so this, this tip amendment just to really reflect the new anticipated costs. We're trying to avoid bid, you know, bids being excessively high over our estimates. So we're going to adjust our estimates ahead of time. This, this tip amendment reflects this project's anticipated uh, budget. Sorry, 9.8. Increase. Hopefully, prices are stabilizing a little bit, and this is it. Just to, any questions? We have a motion to approve project R342 as presented. Let's see if I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Most of the area. Okay. All right. Welcome to the Ross and Melissa. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, so it is just to realigning for the final phase of Washington Western BRT, um, the funding sources and matching the overall phases of the, of the project, such as the realignment uh, for FTA. 
purposes. Yes, basically we had, it's already been approved, the total amount of funding, the funding sources, the basis, it's just um, FTA had asked us to change which funding source is supporting which phase. So we're just updating how the, how the different phases are distributed between the different funding sources. So no change in total, just no change, regards. no change in total, no change in scope, just shifting around. Any questions? Hearing that, I'll take a motion to approve T134 as presented. Second. First item on the agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Thank you. And back up the CDTA. All right. Um, another exciting grant. This is a continued sort of the trend of uh, our ability for uh, using a BRT set aside to have design. This is attributed to the overall Washington Western BRT uh, project where we were able to uh, use that money then for design of the Albany garage and then to look at how to uh, expand our electric fleet. Uh, we were successful in getting uh, funding from the FTA, their low, no, uh, low or no emission vehicle program. Uh, that'll fund a number of different things. One, 12 buses. We have uh, five that are operating now, three more that are coming in, uh, and then this would purchase another 12 buses. So soon we'll have, uh, we'll have 20 uh, electric buses in our fleet and slowly but surely increase those uh, over time. Uh, this will also get us the infrastructure needed to meet the overall mandate of 25% of our fleet, which is roughly about 60 buses um, and uh, the overall, uh, for the overall fleet, the 60 buses that would be electric. Um, that infrastructure includes a partnership with National Grid to get actual power to our 110 water bleed site, which is right near where the green, uh, the greenway is going to go past. Um, that's our main uh, garage just off of Everett Road. Uh, so that's where our electric fleet will be held. So one, it's bringing the power to actually uh, charge the vehicles, but then the actual infrastructure in our garage, uh, the chargers themselves. Um, it's uh, $25 million from the, the feds with uh, our, our match of roughly about 4 million, so $29 million overall. Uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, in the future, we're gonna come back in early 2023 to give you to give the committee an overall uh, presentation. Jeremy Smith, you know, from, who was with the city of Water Police, he's our director of facilities. He'll come in and tell you everything that we're gonna be doing in the future. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, obviously a, a huge success and you know, ties right back to uh, the funding that we received from the TIP to again, allow us to do design, flush out concepts, and then go after that money and be more competitive than, than other transit points. You need to expand your building then? No, so what this is why it ties into Washington Western. So Washington Western included the expansion. So if you go past our site, it's actually wrapped, we're wrapping up that expansion now. Um, so that was built in a manner in a way that can attribute uh, the space for these electric buses. Any other questions? What's the grid cost to get power to your facility? I knew I was, I was ready for Steve's question. Uh, so we're going to come back with all of the details for you, Steve. I wouldn't know exactly that. that. We share your thing. Yeah, thank you. Great. <laughs> Customer service. Yeah. Um, all right. Patrick, a second. Steve, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Substantial. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to C for the UPWP, and Sandy's going to review the draft solicitation. Thanks, Sean. Um, so we are at that time of year. Um, this is the second year we're attempting this, uh, where we will be soliciting for transportation planning projects from local governments in the region. Um, this is sort of a retooled approach to how we build our unified planning work program, which is our uh, document that outlines how our planning funds are to be used in the region. Um, it not only funds our staff activities, but it funds a lot of the consultant work that we share with you over the years. Um, and we're expanding into some other, other areas. 
Um, we retooled this a little bit based on our experience last year, um, given that I was literally hired, you know, a month before we, we pulled this together last year. Um, but, you know, we, we learned, we learned from that experience and uh, have expanded and sort of changed um, the approach to how we're, we're going to uh, ask for uh, planning activities. Um, you will know we've made uh, about a million dollars available um, for, our, for the region through the solicitation. Um, that is flexible number actually might be end up being a little higher based on very, very new information I just received from um, NISDOT. Um, but, you know, we still want all of these ideas to be consistent with our regional planning principles in our metropolitan transportation plan, you know, to connect why we do new visions, as we call it, or the metropolitan regional transportation plan is, is that provides the framework for which we um, assign all of these federal funds that come to our region. So what we did this year to kind of help maybe the members and the communities think about what we mean when we set what kind of a project does regional operations and travel really like? We gave some examples. Um, the idea being to help spur some thought and maybe some questions on, you know, what kinds of things might be eligible for funding. Uh, so we did this for all of the major principles within um, our regional transportation plan. There's a few special ones like payment condition data collection for which we do more contract work. So if your community is into, into something like that, um, you know, we're asking you to reach out to us and have a conversation about what that would be, you know, how that kind of a program would be managed. Um, but there's a whole range of things that we can do uh, with these funds. Um, and lots of examples uh, in a range of transportation uh, planning activities. The other thing we did is instead of we kind of built upon what we started structurally last year, if you may recall, we had sort of three categories. We had technical assistance, which was kind of the small stuff that maybe staff could do or simple data collection activities, those kinds of things. And then we had our traditional, what we call our leakage planning program work so that, you know, 50 to $100,000 ish uh, planning um, projects in a municipality or in a you know, a, a group of municipalities. And then we had these regional projects, which is where things like the, the regional uh, Patroon Creek Greenway project was funded. And we expanded that this year, um, again, to talk about the scale, give some examples of what we could include, give you guys some estimates in terms of the cost ranges, you know, what could we fund? And we changed up the matching requirement um, so that on the technical assistance side, um, we, we don't even require a cash match anymore. We just ask for municipal time. That could be in the form of volunteers. It could be a, a staff member assigned to just assist with the project, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, we're not even asking for cash. If you contribute cash, it's always a plus, but it's not required for technical assistance any longer. Um, we also have continued support for the community planning or our linkage program planning work. You will note that we've increased the maximum request to $150,000. Um, you know, we've had it at about $100,000 for many, many years. Cost of things have changed, scale of projects has changed. So we wanted to make sure we were reflecting the range of possible projects that might come up um, in this program. This is either cash or in kind at the 10% level. We've given some examples. You can always refer back to our linkage program website for uh, specific examples, um, but we hope to capture a range of intermunicipal and, and municipal specific um, planning work um, in this category. And then the large scale. Um, we've capped this large scale request at $250,000, um, but these are really intended to be these larger than regional sort of projects, whether that's, uh, you know, a major corridor study on Central Avenue from end to end, uh, where you're involving multiple municipalities or um, some county level trail feasibility projects, you know, something that would be involving multiple jurisdictions, have regional benefit, um, and may come up because maybe there's a series of communities that have the same issue, and we're seeing, well, geez, if we put these four communities together, we can fund one large regional initiative. Um, and there's lots of examples of that. Um, in this case, because of the scale, you know, we would request a, a little bit of a higher match contribution of not less than 15% cash or in kind, not less than 10%. Um, 
Um, but we're trying to give as much flexibility as we can um, so that you know, we do still have to have match on our federal funds. That's just a, a basic, it's usually about 5%. Um, but we want to make sure that the communities that propose these projects have some skin in the game um, and are committed to working with us on um, any of the initiatives that are suggested. Um, we've expanded and sort of flushed out in a little more detail what our ineligible activities are because NEPA and SEEK are coming up more and more often. Um, these are sort of more design level efforts that you know, we, we really can't get to. We can get a community to a point where they have a document they can use in NEPA and SEEKER. But to do the NEPA and seeker process is beyond the scope of what we can do in planning funds. Um, I also clarify, or we also clarify, what we mean by surveying. Um, some people was, were interpreting that as like community surveys, like I can't ask. That's not what we meant. We meant like land survey. So, you know, little things like that. Um, we tried just to make sure we under what we meant by operations. We're talking about, you know, we're not going to pay for CDTA's transit fleet, you know, in this program. Um, so we just provided some more clarification there. The project administration is similar to how we've done it in the past for consultant-led work. CDTC will still handle the consultant uh, procurement process and manage the consultant contracts on local government behalf. Um, or we still require an, M an MOU. For the small scale work, we are going to require that it's completed by March 1st. We want all the small scale stuff done um, in the fiscal year, which of course goes from April 1st, 2023, through the end of March of 2024. Um, we'll have a little more time to work on the consultant studies, but for the municipalities, we wanna make sure that that MOU gets signed by September 30th. So again, if April 1 is uh, the start date of the new PWP, you have basically the summer to get that MOU signed. There shouldn't be any reason why a community can't do that. If they can't do that, we're gonna pull the money back. Um, because we want to keep things moving forward. The time frame for the study at the point we have the consultant on board, we're asking no more than 18 months. So once that contract is executed, there's these milestones that we're asking everybody to adhere to as best we can. Um, again, volunteers can be used for in kind. It doesn't always have to be staff. It can be appointed officials as well. There's different ways we can account for match. Um, we're going to be asking sponsors to submit a quarterly report on their match um, if they're using uh, staff services or in kind to support their planning efforts. Um, and most of the rest of these are just sort of a snapshot of the typical things that you see that you know happening with federal funds, you can't use federal for federal for match, um, et cetera. Public participation, you know, for any of our consultant led work with a few exceptions will require some kind of a public participation element. Um, things like traffic volume data collection, these sorts of nuts and bolts sort of activities, you won't necessarily need to have public uh, participation, but we'll use CDTC's public participation plan as, uh, as a guide. Um, just a reminder of our Title VI and non-discrimination policies that are in here. And then for pre-application, as I said at the beginning, if you have an idea that you're thinking about in your community or in a group of communities, um, feel free to contact us to discuss it prior to submitting a proposal if, you, if you'd like some more guidance or sort of clarification on, on the process. We'll have a workshop Thursday, October 20th at one o'clock. Um, we're encouraging you to attend if you're thinking about applying give you an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, we can flesh out any more details. And the application would be due on Wednesday, November 3rd at five o'clock. We're only accepting them electronically. There will be a job form, which is why you see the insert link here um, that we have. We're gonna actually simplify that for you to make this as easy to apply for as possible. Um, but some basic elements are still needed, like a cover letter signed by the leader, local elected official or the CEO of your, of your entity. Um, if it's a situation where you have a nonprofit applying, you need a supporting letter from that community in which the project is being proposed so that we know that there's submitted in coordination there. If it's a location-based project, the project map is always helpful. Um, we also... Um, we'll be indicating if you're submitting an idea for a roadway or an, or a transportation facility you do not own, just getting some kind of letter of commitment or endorsement from the entity. So, for example, if you were 
wanting to do something on Central Avenue and you're the village of Colony, you would just reach out to DOT just to say, hey, we're thinking about applying for funds to do something. And they would just submit you a letter uh, to you for to say, we're willing to work with you, basically. Um, so we'll ask for that. And then if there's in terms of the in-kind services and matching funds, if you're if you're using partners beyond your municipality um, to assist with providing match, just again a letter indicating that. Um, so that way the local sponsors and we know where the matches are coming from. Um, we've updated the project evaluation process this year. We created a very simple 25-point evaluation matrix. The criteria and the, and the point values are listed here so you understand um, the emphasis. Not surprising, you know, how it relates back to new visions and federal planning factors, um, whether it's in an environmental justice area or not as defined by CDTC, um, is it an intermunicipal partnership? Uh, we're really trying to encourage community to work together as much as possible. Many, you know, in conversations I've met, been meeting with many of the local elected officials, starting with our policy board members, and there's a lot of common themes across communities that if we could just work together on these very simple things, it would be great. Um, hence regionalism, regional planning. But um, so we're trying to incentivize them. You know, there, there doesn't have to be the big thing. It can be a small thing. You know, one example that was raised by um, Andrew was unwarranted traffic signals. You know, a lot of communities have issues with unwarranted traffic signals. Well, we had four or five communities submit a joint proposal to look at that broadly. That might be something that would score well in something like this. So as an example. Um, so you know, you have to read through the, the remaining criteria and basically our timeline, we're gonna following approval today. Um, the policy board obviously authorized you folks to issue this and make this uh, public. <coughs> we're gonna shoot to get it out October 10th. Um, that sponsor workshop again is the 20th. Applications are due on the 30th of November. We'll evaluate them in December and then bring to the planning committee in January our staff recommendations for funding. Then we'll take the rest of January, complete the build of the rest of the Unified Planning Work Program, and then have a draft Unified Planning Work pro Program for you to review at the February planning committee meeting. And then subsequently the March uh, open public review, of course, and then have the March policy board um, approval. So that's the timeline. Um, one other change is, you know, just to increase, improve the communication to sponsors. We'll make sure that everybody who proposed an idea um, is notified prior to the January 4th meeting. So basically they're going to get the materials you folks would get um, so that everybody understands where we're at prior to the planning committee taking action and doing work. Um, so that will help with uh, making sure everybody understands um, where they are at. So that is a brief overview of our plan. Hopefully this will be more clear this year. Uh, hopefully it will spur some interesting ideas. Um, again, you know, look at our regional plan, look at the priorities in that plan, think about things that you're struggling with in your community, no matter what they are. If it has a connection to transportation, even on the loosest sense of the term, ask for it, you never know. Um, because there's a lot of things that may not be specific to transportation, but are related. Um, there can be land use planning, it can be site design issues, there's a whole range of things. So I will stop there unless there's any questions. I got a silly question, you probably say I shouldn't know the answer to it. We're talking about regionalism. What's our relationship with Montgomery County? So they are outside of CDTC's region. Right now, they are part of the CDTA family. So. Uh, that's kind of where my, my head was all when we were talking about. Yeah. You've got, you've got, you know, Route 5, you're in Scotia and Skanky, and then we're talking about plans that are there, and then it just stops in Amsterdam's eight miles away. Yeah, it's it's a top, at least since I have taken over here, it hasn't come up recently. But, you know, now that CDTA is involved with Montgomery planning, planning of Montgomery County's transit planning, um, you know, the question could come up again. The question that, you know, the policy board would have to consider here is what are the implications to the existing membership? Does this, does, would, would adding additional county or population to the CDTC region increase funding or would it mean funding gets stretched further because we're spreading over a larger geographic area? And that would be the question that 
folks would have to think about if that if that topic ever even came up. So who's you know, the money are they in? They're yeah. they're in region two, okay. region two, so they're not even in region one. Correct. So, so they're not okay. Makes it more than Yeah, yeah, that's okay. And the no region one. two towards Utica. So they're the central office of Utica, so they're okay. Parker Road, Montgomery, and yes. We get we and we certainly agree. I mean, from a geographic perspective, and there is a logic there. There's a lot of commuting going back and forth between here and Amsterdam. These artificial boundaries that have been created by all of the institutions over the years just kind of make things interesting mm -hmm. from how funding is delivered and how programs are delivered. Okay. And currently, they're not in an NPO area at all. They're okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So they're not even in the region two NPO. Area. No one's commuting from Amsterdam to Utica. Just leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> I like books. Right. Any other questions? Seeing none, I have a motion to approve the solicitation. Mayor? Steve? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. I'm going to have to step away. I did let Sandy know I'm going to be eating, so Sandy is going to step in. And yes, as uh, the protocol states, I am officially the secretary, so I will be taking the reins for the remainder of the meeting. Thank you, Sean. Yes, thank you, everybody. Today. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, the safety performance measure for its approval. Um, as you may recall, the federal government has established multiple performance measures for the transportation system. Um, safety is one. Each year, um, for the specific to the safety targets, we review the NISDOT proposed targets for the state, and the MPO makes a determination as to whether or not they're going to accept the state's targets and try to make progress on them or set their own. For a lot of reasons, um, it makes a lot of sense to simply endorse what um, DOT proposes. This year is an interesting year. Um, and I actually will show a different um, graphic to illustrate this. But um, COVID had some impacts, as has been well documented, on safety, um, not only here in New York State, but across the country. Um, accounting for that, um, there's been a very modest um, approach to target setting for this year um, because the trend line kind of changed a bit in the 2020 year um, when you know policing wasn't what it was. There was a lot of high speed uh, crashes, um, not only in the region, but in the country. And we had an increase um, in some pedestrian fatalities um, across the country and bicycle fatalities as well. Um, so these targets um, represent basically a 1% decrease as a goal for, for this uh, five-year period. This is a little bit of a complicated mathematic scenario, but if they do a five-year rolling average to develop these um, to smooth out bumps in the road like we just had. So the 2020 year doesn't sort of um, increase it as much as um, the smoothing out over a period of five years would. Um, I will show you in another share screen um, some of how CDTC's data relates. Stephen, if you can give me a thumbs up that we're seeing it line. You're not seeing it online? You are now. Okay, great. Um, so again, this is where at the statewide level with the 2020 data, um, where the state uh, did between the five-year rolling average between 2013 through 2027, 20, I can't speak today, 2013 through 2017, and then the current five-year period, which is 2016 through 2020. Um, and we put this data together, the 2020 reduction target, as I said from the other document, um, is the goal of reducing it by 1%, but this is what actually happened. Um, and we saw some significant increases in uh, serious injuries. Now, interesting, in our region, we actually saw 
or our state, I should say, we actually saw a decrease in fatalities, but the fatality rate, serious injuries, um, non-motorized, most of these did not make our state um, safety targets, uh, which means there's a whole other exercise going on at the state level of how we're going to account for that because there's penalties involved, meaning the federal government sort of forces the state to spend highway safety improvement program funding on certain types of projects to make progress on not meeting those targets. Now, I don't think any state across the country made their targets last year. So this is not looking at it through the lens of, wow, something really bad happened here in New York State. In all honesty, COVID happened. Um, and that was a big thing. So specific to the CDTC region, just to show you where we stack up, same time frames, um, um, what our data showed is our fatalities, our rate of fatalities, our number of serious injuries decreased. Mm -hmm. Our rate of some serious injuries still decreased, but not to the target level. Um, and we still decreased our number of non-motorized and non-motorized uh, fatalities and serious injuries. So message being here, when you scale it to our region, surprisingly, mm -hmm. if you look at the statewide numbers, doing well. we're doing we're doing well, um, which is great news. So we feel it's a very reasonable approach to accept the state's 1% reduction target. I think we're making a lot of progress in this region. Um, that you're not seeing at the state level. And, and you guys know with the numbers, the New York City situation drives most of what happens. In the I was going to say, is, is New York City pulling down all that data Absolutely. because the rate of fatalities and injuries is up? Correct. Absolutely. Where do e-bikes fit in there? E-bikes, um, they right now are still considered, I believe, uh, from a crash perspective, from if I'm wrong, they're still considered non-motorized. It's considered a bicycle. Because they're still considered a bicycle. But I'm sure that definition is going to be updated because they're not the only motorized active transportation source now. In fact, I just saw the two, the one, the single wheel vehicles. Now there's some legislation. Oh, <laughs> you've, you've seen the guy on Wolf Road literally looks like a skateboard with a wheel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah they're, they're, they're developing uh, regulations for that kind of um, use as well. So it's what we've seen is that they're yeah. being more involved in accidents, uh, whether it be scooters, e-bikes, those unicycle type things, um, just because of what they're utilizing and how they're utilizing. The speeds right. um, yep. are much more than a regular bicycle. Double, double the triple. Yeah. Yeah. And just to show you the raw, sort of the raw numbers year to year, unlike what the pattern we've seen in some places um, around the country, when you look at just our region's fatalities, here's the 2020 year, the fatalities did go up. But when you look at the five-year average, it, it levels out because even though they went up as a result of the COVID crisis, we were almost on par back in 2015 when we really started to emphasize safety in the federal legislation. So we were making progress and we lost it with COVID, but we think that it's going to start coming back down. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that uh, when we see review this next year, we'll see similar patterns. Again, the injuries of fatality rate is also up again, but remembering the rates based on how many vehicles were on the road. COVID, there was a lot less vehicles on the road, it drives up the rate. Um, but it also speed it also drove up reckless driving um, without the enforcement. Similar similarly with the serious injuries. Um, overall serious injuries were actually surprisingly down. Um, based on trends nationally, but that's good news for us. But when you look at the rate, again, because of the lower number of drivers on the road, it was a little bit higher. Um, and non-motorized, um, still we're trending downward, uh, which is which is a good news story. So that's just, you know, a quick overview um, of that. Um, any questions about the performance measures? Anything you wanted to add on the department's part, Greg? Not too much, just super quick. It when the, the advantage of adopting the statewide goal is that the requirements when you don't meet the target are intensive to the analysis and the reporting and the process. So by adopting the statewide targets, you're leaving it to our main office to sort out. And it's probably the best place for it because it, it would stop up way too much staff time here if we try to adopt any of our own targets on any of these categories. So it's a it's a good, good move to just stop the statewide. Hopefully, 
to thin by the R. So. Great. And just one comment from our viewers, uh, from Tina. My understanding is that e bikes level one and two are considered non motorized and legal on roads of under 30 miles per hour. Level three e bikes are not legal to ride still here in the state. So, a little context for that. Okay. So, um, with that, we need a motion to support the state's um, safety performance targets and recommend the policy board's approval. Let's do that. Oh, second. Second. Andrew? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstains? All right. Thank you. All right, next up is um, we have a technical assistance request from the city of Saratoga Springs. I don't know if Susan or um, Tina wanted to discuss it themselves or we can review the document. I'm happy to. Um, sure. This is a um, project for a study for um, bike pad accommodations um, from the west side of Saratoga Springs, kind of connecting to um, businesses and services um, on West Avenue and beyond. So we've seen there's a lot of um, existing um, subdivisions, residential units on the West side. And in the last couple of years, we've seen a couple of big um, workforce affordable housing projects and a lot of biking and walking on some state routes, um, Route 9 and Route 29. So safety is a concern. Um, these are busy uh, roads, and so the study is to um, find the best route. And then with that study, try to look for some funding. Great. So we're working uh, in partnership with CDRPC. Um, we're proposing to assist with about $10,000 of staff time, matching um, city staff about $3,500 for roughly a $13,500 technical assistance project. Um, so we need a motion to approve this funding for the Saratoga Springs project. Second. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstains? Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for your patience on the um, action items. We'll go to the um, discussion items and we'll start with the equity policy uh, development. So, um, I'm going to start with Francis' PowerPoint. And hopefully that's displaying for the audience uh, remotely. Um, so this initiative, thanks, Stephen. So this initiative, um, you know, why are we even talking about this? Um, it started with a conversation internally when I took over here as director about our equity advisory committee. Um, our equity advisory committee had, in previous years, you you would find no information on it about it on our website. It's kind of I'm kind of not sure what they were doing and who was involved in, in trying to generate interest in it through a solicitation for membership um, was, a, was a bit of a challenge. So we were trying to think about ways of evolving this equity advisory committee, which was reinforced in the bipartisan infrastructure law. As you probably know, equity is all over the infrastructure law, whether it be in uh, criteria for funding opportunities, um, or just the Biden administration's and federal highways um, emphasis on equity to integrate um, disadvantaged or underserved populations into not only the transportation planning process, but also into organizational operations here um, at NPOs like CBTC. And given that we were about to embark on the update of the Unified Planning Work Program, we thought it was a good time um, to take a look at what our options were. So we had staff uh, do a very, a very quick and dirty um, peer review, uh, looking at 12 NPOs that were roughly the same size as ours. There were some issues and practices that NPOs of our size typically don't get into. So we looked at some larger NPO practices um, just for comparison purposes. And, and the five NPOs we found most 
informative were Dayton, Ohio, Milwaukee, Omaha, Nebraska, Springfield, Massachusetts, and San Francisco. Now, obviously, France, San Francisco is a much larger metropolitan area than us. But it just serves as a, an interesting example for, for what you can do in this topic area. Um, the peer review conclusions uh, illustrated how it is unusual for MPOs like our size to have even have an equity committee. Um, typically where they, they exist, they're used to help create things like the environmental justice title six analysis report that we're required to do and, and don't really go much beyond that. Um, MPOs, um that do have the committees are often dealing with topics beyond transportation because either they're housed within a regional planning commission or they coordinate with other institutions like universities or nonprofit groups um, to look at the topic more broadly than just straight transportation um, one tool that we found that we thought would be of interest to cdtc would be a resolution or even a platform um, that can state our position and commitment to equity. And there were two examples of that from San Francisco and um, Omaha. Not surprisingly, the San Francisco example really represents sort of the Cadillac of what we observed in our peer review, um, where they have a whole section dedicated on their website to their equity platform, which really is designed to be inclusive, create designs and solutions for uh, areas of concern, increase opportunity for um, involvement in the process, shifting even decision-making power to the people in underserved areas to have more of a voice to say in the, some of the decision-making, investing in training and education. Um, so they have a pretty robust uh, approach to it um, at, at MTC uh, in San Francisco. Um, what we're suggesting uh, as an example or a model that we could potentially follow is more what the Omaha, Nebraska MPO did, which is simply have a resolution and a statement of the kinds of things that we would work on as an organization to in better integrate um, equity in our decision making process to be more inclusive um, and increase the diversity of the folks so that even the people in this room better represent the demographics of our region. Um, so there are some model language that we pulled from this particular resolution that is uh, we shared with our policy board uh, back in September, and that's the document that's available on our website um, as part of the agenda today. Uh, but it just gives some samples of some of the statements that can be made. And um, what the policy board authorized uh, us to do is to develop an equity of policy to be adopted via resolution. At the staff level, um, and as part of that um, authorization, we want it to be developed cooperatively with the folks here at this table, with the Equity Advisory Committee, and of course, our staff. Um, we thought at staff level, the easiest place to start this conversation was just on CBTC operations, um, how to you know, work on diversifying and getting more um, inclusive representation here at the table, how to better utilize the equity advisory committee, what tasks can we assign them, what role can they play as an advisory committee to CDTC and kind of strengthening their purpose. Um, and then maybe as through this exploration, we would expand to future topics. Um, there's a whole range of things. We also believe that although we haven't seen it yet from the New York State Department of Transportation, when the upcoming guidance document is released from the UPWP, we suspect because of the emphasis in the infrastructure law, there may or may not be some provisions in that document um, that will force this issue um, on all of the MPOs across the state. Um, so this is a time to really kind of start taking this topic um, seriously. Um, it gives us the uh, opportunity to kind of have a lot of broad conversations on it. Um, and so the next steps is we're looking for some volunteers of this body who would be willing to uh, maybe have a quick Zoom meeting or two outside of these meetings to kind of discuss this idea. Um, we're gonna meet with our equity advisory committee on October 17th. Um, you folks are will, you know, welcome to attend that to listen to the conversation um, and the concerns that that group may have. Um, and then we'll work on drafting some sort of a resolution. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. If you're interested, um, you don't have to tell me right this second, but you can send me an email to speak to us after the meeting. Um, but we would love to have a few volunteers to help assist in, in building this, um, this language for this resolution. Any questions? 
since I'm representing Mark, I can nominate him, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and if I do, what will happen is he'll come back to me, <laughs> which I am interested in. So I will I will speak to Mark and I'll send you a note. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, that doesn't require any action, but you know, the policy board just want to let you know that this is what they're interested in. And we're gonna do our best to come up with something that I think the region will be will be happy with. So thank you. Going back to the tip. Stick performance. Um, I will turn it over to Jacob to talk about um, where things are at. Um, I don't think we had any handouts or materials. Um, to refresh it. Okay. Oh, it's still going. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so we we did have a handout. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, and it's printed up front as well for those of you in the room. Um, so each year, Federal Highway evaluates us, the MPL, as well as DOT on STIP performance. Um, and STIP performance can mean a couple <laughs> different things, but here, um, the measure that they're evaluating us on is the measure of obligated construction phases compared to the number of total construction phases in a given federal fiscal year. Um, and it's something that Federal Highway kind of checks in with us about on a regular basis, and it's on our radar. Um, and we have a couple different goals that we're trying to meet. Uh, the first one is the amended SIP performance. Um, and that's so at the end of a, a year, um, we want to try to obligate 95% of all construction phases uh, that are left on the TIP at the end of that year after all amendments are done. Um, so that's if, if something is, is moved out during the year, um, you know, it, it doesn't really get included in the amended step performance uh, goal. Um, and that one we're typically in good shape on. Uh, I don't have the exact percentage for last federal fiscal year, 21.2, um, but talking with DOT, I think we're in good shape. Uh, the unamended step performance though, is one that uh, we've kind of been uh, talked about a little bit, uh, from FHWA, uh, we're typically not meeting this 75%. So unamended meaning when they take a picture at the beginning of each federal fiscal year, uh, it, you know, no matter what you do in the meantime um, for amendments and moving things out or new projects moving in, it's just that static snapshot of what it looked like at the beginning of, uh, of the year. So. That being said, we try to kind of get ahead of it and reach out to sponsors to see if they're gonna obligate a construction phase, um, in this case, in the current federal fiscal year, um, to try to move that out to next year um, if they know that they're not gonna obligate construction. Um, so over the past month, we've reached out to seven different local project sponsors um, with uh, 12 different local projects that had construction um, in federal fiscal year 23. Um, of those 12 projects, nine of them were expected to not be obligated by uh, the end of next September. Um, so we would like to be pushing those out into the following fiscal year, 2024, <laughs> so that they don't in get included in the snapshot for unamended stiff performance for this year. Uh, right now, we're currently working with DOT to actually make those changes. So nothing has been made as of yet. Um, for those sponsors that I've reached out to, uh, you know, we've talked about this and, and uh, EOT has followed up. And like I said, we're just kind of waiting on making those changes. I'm not sure if we've met the snapshot um, time. That's kind of always been a question mark. When it was that a is. little after the beginning of the year. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. hopefully we still have time. Um, and really, again, this is, just us trying to kind of get ahead of next year's stiff performance. Um, and these changes that will be made are just schedule changes. So um, there'll be project selection uh, with no amendments needed. Questions on that? In summary, it's an accounting thing. <laughs> <laughs> so not only do we have to try to make fiscal constraint work and moving projects around mm -hmm. on the budget side, we also need to make sure that they're actually getting obligated. So um, a couple of different things that 
work against each other in some ways. Okay. Okay. Um, there's any, no other questions on that. Uh, we will just here. Um, we don't have because the what Jacob just <coughs> described uh, basically represents the tip project selection. Is we don't have anything new to share within. Yes. Yeah, so since the last meeting, we haven't had any of those project selection moves. Again, small changes in projects that don't require amendments. Um, I would expect that next month we're going to have quite a few. Uh, because we may have some that are associated with the stiff performance, as well as um, some that are going to be associated with aligning the 19.4 tip with the approved uh, tip in this year in 23. So none this month, but likely have quite a few next month to catch up with things. Okay, great. And then project delivery update. So project delivery, um, again, we're reaching out to project sponsors, um, or actually mostly consultants. I have been behind on reaching out to project sponsors. I've got to get back on track on that. But, you know, this is all kind of relates back to that uh, tip performance as well. Um, you know, part of the reason why we do try to, to make those monthly contacts with sponsors is to just see, um, you know, what kind of progress is being made. Um, and again, if it's something that we can kind of identify ahead of time that uh, construction might not be in the right year, uh, we can try to move that around and get it where it needs to be. Um, but we still are getting um, pretty consistent updates from consultants. Um, so just a few notes. Um, Town of Colony, Albany Shaker Road uh, project preliminary design was authorized in June. Uh, we've got a Green Island project proposed at pavement preservation. Letting was held in December. Um, and also the Town of Rotterdam uh, group 5S bike and pet access improvements uh, had a completed draft design report in June. Um, so a couple highlights there. Um, again, keep an eye out. I, I've got to go back through my list um, and kind of redo the schedule for reaching out to sponsors uh, for those monthly project updates um, and get back on track at the beginning of that fiscal year here. So keep an eye out for those emails. Um, and as always, take a look at the project spreadsheet. Um, if there's any of your projects that you want to provide updates on in the meantime, uh, we'd be happy to hear about them. Feel free to, to reach out to me. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, next up is anything from NISA or project related? Uh, I guess a couple of things I can mention are, <clears throat> are somewhat awaited Glenridge Road project. The, the next steps and last steps, I think we have in our toolbox to prevent bridge hits to that project's getting wet uh November 3rd. And hopefully components like the laser and the uh various components that go with it are available everything's cool. in Florida. Yep. But uh if we're letting it on purpose early and this is kind of to another topic of lead time is we're letting it this November so that the contractor hopefully has six to eight months to procure everything before the season starts. Uh, that's one project we're trying to adopt the strategy of letting a contract and just letting it sit for six months to get the procurement started and hopefully we get materials in time. Um, another project is not on the tip, but a state funded project that's moving forward is also uh, Union Ave Route 9P from exit 14 to, to East Ave, we're uh, nearing PSD and that project as well. It's state funds, so I haven't shown them on the tip, but uh, that's going to make a, a, a dedicated bike lane both ways uh, to connect an area where there's been a lot of concern about bikes in the travel lanes, which is virtually for shoulders currently. So that's, that's headed for construction too. It has a lot of granite curb, and I guess granite curbs in the short supply, so that. Hopefully we can get time. Um, so related to this issue of material shortage, I, I, I think there was a desire to have a quick conversation about uh, this issue and how it's affecting uh, local sponsors and if there were things that could be done or not done to help with that. Um, did any member want to speak to that issue? either here in the room or listening virtually? Well, I can add something that we were asked to do. 
um, and that is have our public work or our public utilities acquire material for transportation projects, um, such as for betterment items, rather than having the contractor um, purchase. Uh, it, it, I don't particularly care for it, but um, it's something that we did in order to try to get a cost savings uh, as well as utilize the relationships that our public utilities have with, in this instance, pipe suppliers, um, and also be able to horse trade it if necessary. Um, but again, the, it's new, it's something that we did. Um, and uh, we've yet to see whether it's going to be successful or not because the transition of ownership um, and use, you know, if a problem with the material comes online, then who's at fault? Where's the liability? Um, a lot of issues. So we'll see how it pans out. It's, it's tricky for sure. Uh, one caution everybody is we can't use federal aid to stockpile. So if you have a federal aid project, we can't stockpile materials ahead of a contract. The only mechanism is to let the contractor purchase it with federal aid. So if anyone wants to stockpile their own stuff, unfortunately, you have to use non-federal funds for that. And because this was a better portion, that's what we did. Yeah. It's a tricky topic. Um, Chris Wallen, I see your hand up online. All right, thank you. I was just going to mention that uh, I've talked with Greg and Lorenzo about the impact that the delays are having. And it actually, uh, you know, I, it's affected all of our terrible angle. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's affected all of our construction inspection. Um, so I've had every project that involves signals, I've had construction inspection go somewhere around 25 to 30 percent over on all the jobs because the GCs may be done. And um, we may be able to put poles in, but we don't have computers, cabinets, and heads. So that's um, delaying us from getting the projects completed. You know, I have uh, projects that are open that are federal aid that have been open for over a year um, with just signal components waiting. And so I, I know that there was some talk about stockpiling, what we could do. You know, I think it's also changed how I'm viewing projects going forward. I think, Greg, you mentioned the curbing. Um, so a couple of my project have all stopped uh, because of curbing. We don't have curbing. Um, uh, Brandywine Avenue, a local project, Washington Avenue, which is going to be our, um, what, what do we call that thing? Uh, not a cycle track, our counterflow bike lane. That project is on hold because of uh, curbing. So we're looking at building projects backwards a little bit. And I also, uh, one of the things we're talking about is how to put I don't know, more language or onus on the primes in a way, uh, because with the PSAP project, Callanan, they went in and they, you know, they ripped up all the intersections, they got their work done, and then they were done. They said, okay, now it's Stillsync's turn. But Stillsync said, well, we're down crews and equipment and this and this and this. And it took them two extra months to complete their portion of the project. But Callanan, in their mind, they were done with theirs. And so it, it caused a lot of uh, stress downtown because we had downtown open for several months longer than we wanted to. So I, I don't know what the solution is. I'm, I'm willing to you know work with everybody to talk about it, but there is a financial impact and there is a time impact. And I, I, you know it's the same thing what we're talking about with, uh, in the city, we like to put on our contracts, um, substantial completion dates with, uh, with liquidated damages at the end, but, if you have to suppliers causing these issues and you can't actually get the uh, the components, then how does that affect it? And, and what what I guess vehicles you're going to put in place to deal with it? So it's it's an issue. I, I, it's it's something that I never thought we'd have to deal with. You know, you took for granted that you could always get curb, and uh, you know, we used to buy 500 feet of curb and we get it in four weeks. We'd stockpile it, and uh, you know, it, it's not not the case anymore. So we're all we're all kind of having to think outside the box and deal with a new reality. The, the signals though are, are an, an issue. Um, and I don't know when that, you know, I don't know when that gets better and, and not for nothing. I, I really appreciate working with Stilsing 
Um, but they seem to be the only game in town a lot of times. So everybody is using the same. Everyone in the region is using Stilsing and everyone in the region is using straight line. So trying to get projects lined up and done, um, even though we have Callanan and Louise and Newcastle and Reifenberg, uh, there still seems to be only a couple of the subs that are used on these federal aid projects. So it, it creates a, a pinch point for subcontracting. Brandy, you're yep, Randy, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, we're experiencing just unprecedented challenges. Uh, the granite curbing shortage, long lead times, we're talking eight to 12 months on traffic signals. Uh, we can get a lot of equipment, we can't get head push buttons. So, really, in actuality, uh, it's really a challenge for us. We've already delayed projects um, until next year. You know, the city alone with our paving contracts, there was roughly about 15,000 linear feet of curbing. And we've just gone back and forth with our contractor. And typically uh, we're done with our paving right now. We probably are, you know, getting into here probably to the end of October, really prolonging things uh, another month. Um, but it really adds just another level of complexity. We also got a lot of challenges uh, putting projects out to bid and contractors actually reluctant to bid. Um, you know, liquidated damages and that you really can't enforce if, you know, you have to prove damage and it, it has to be something that the contractor's done. Now, if you can't get material, it's a supply chain issue. Um, we're really, we're actually excluding those from the contracts at this point because we really can't enforce it. Um, you know, the other challenges become, as Chris mentioned, you only got so many players in the region, straight line uh, for striping, you know, still sing, you get, there's a couple other electrical subs, but they have labor shortages them, themselves. We have paving contractors that we're talking to, you got the president and the vice president running the paver because they can't find labor. Um, you know, some of these companies were paying, you know, truck drivers 20 some dollars an hour now they're up to 40 50 bucks an hour so uh i don't know i can drive a truck pretty well um so uh, it, it seems a lot less stressful than what we're dealing with so i know it's it's not just an isolated situation here it's impacting everyone and just in the big picture i think in the long run i don't see things getting much better in the near future hopefully things improve um, but I think it's going to impact a lot of these projects going forward and just not sure, you know, how we're going to deal with that. Yeah. Thank you. I, I guess I'm glad this came up just from sharing this from everyone else's experiences that I guess haven't tripped on this yet. Um, we'll continue to share our best advice. The, the contractor language. Yeah, we, we really need to lean on our crimes and not start work that they can't finish because they, they just blame the other guy and that's not a that's not a reason we gotta we gotta really get you know know they're ready all the way around uh is, is one recommendation letting a contract and just let it sit for eight months is kind of the other strategy just let them get it out get it awarded so they know they can procure the material and yeah, just sit you know um I, I don't have too much other better advice it's just what we're trying to do too the estimates are gonna yeah. be way off when it comes in though and we were, we were talking about prior to the meeting beginning i mean all jokes aside what just happened in florida and south carolina when the federal government they haven't already pulled the emergency resource card to you know there will be a redirect of a lot of material to those heavily damaged parts of the country that's just going to exacerbate the already large problem here. Um, you know, I ironically have a meeting with Mr. Tonko in about 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, I'll just mention this to him at a, at a high level that, you know, that one of the challenges happening locally here is this. Uh, it's not unique to our region, but, you know, it could, could point to a larger conversation as we develop our, our TIP infrastructure um, committee um agenda you know it, maybe there's some practices going on elsewhere that could help inform 
solutions or at least ways to ease the pain a little bit for everybody. And, and maybe that's that should be part of that um, scope work. Any other um, points anyone would like to make on that? You know, Tina has her hand up. No, go right ahead. I just wanted to say everything, <laughs> everything everyone just brought up is perfectly on point. The other thing that's also extending um, just staff resources is the amount of questions that I get because when those intersections are not completed because we're waiting for that poll or we're waiting for whatever that piece of equipment is, it's been taking a lot of staff time to answer all of the um, the questions from the public so it's it you know it affects the project timelines it's affecting making sure that we get everything done on time but also it's just um been very taxing on staff all right well we'll you know continue to listen and try to you know as we build this uh, tip and uh, i should say the tip the tip Infrastructure said committee, you know, our committee, we're going to be hopefully sitting down with DOT to kind of work through the scope of work. I'm hoping to launch that later this year and have some, some members of the planning committee involved in that. So, so stay tuned. Um, hope to have more opportunities to converse on the subject soon. All right. In the interest of time, because I actually do have to leave, um, I'll skip the status of CDTC planning activities for the regional and local. Is there any burning topic that anyone would like to raise before we close the meeting today? So, quick, I'll be super brief. The Pell study for 378 is finally officially underway. Uh, we have a partnering committee with some folks on October 19th. So if you're an adjacent municipality and didn't hear from us, please reach out to us, reach out to me. Uh, to be sure you're invited for the October 19th meeting. It's going to be like CDTA, cities, and two counties. Uh, that's it. Greg, I received confirmation. We did not receive that letter. Okay. I will make sure that goes up today. I just got two, two, three quick updates. Uh, the indicator site has been updated with the 2020 American Community Survey data. So people looking for 2020 data on the indicator site, see our BC candidate. Uh, October 28th is our day long workshop. We'll be back at Hudson Valley Community College. So if you know people that are looking for their planning and zoning credits on your local municipal boards, please send them our way. Um, plenty of space left to register for that. That's October 28th at the uh, Hudson Valley Community College, just like the old days. And then again, um, we have our award ceremony uh, on the evening before, which will be on the 27th. That'll be at Albany at Restaurant Navona. Um, among the awardees are Albany County, Schenectady County, and CDTA. So um, uh, recognizing their achievements in municipal cooperation, the Corny Awards, it's the fifth or sixth year we presented these. So um, stay tuned for information about that. Great. Upcoming meetings and deadlines are on the website. Um, just one final thing while we have Mr. Akheta here, um, because I don't know if we'll be back at future meetings, but in case you're not, um, we at CDTC wanted to thank you for your many years of service Worthy. to you know, the planning committee. You know, I looked back, Steve was one of our original planning committee members. He's represented the airport from the day that this organization had a planning committee. <laughs> um, so incredible service. And we just wanted to take a moment to thank you and give you this um, clap of appreciation for thank all you. your it's been a long way since 1984. <laughs> <laughs> County of Albany, then. Bill Anslo, good to see you. And thank you so much. Yes. Honor and privilege. Oh, thank thank you. you. And we, I'll be around for a few months at least. We got you through the end of the year <laughs> last night, correct? Maybe January. Maybe January. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Right. <laughs> All right. And with that, thank everybody, you so thank you for your uh, time and attention today. And we'll uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Thank oh, you. I guess we need a motion to adjourn. Yeah, I forgot motion. that part. Yeah. Uh, Steve <laughs> and Martin. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>